Yes, Baragon, I'm planning on doing it in voice. Well, it's nice. I see some old friends coming here, and I see some other people I don't recognize. Is anybody coming to Second Science Circle for the first time? If you are, we certainly welcome you to our sim. All right, I have one o'clock. Um, Chantel, we ready to get started? I appreciate everybody being on time. Uh, Mike, are you recording? Let me know when you're ready to go. And this is gonna be real informal. Uh, so feel free to ask questions or comments or if you have something more extensive you'd like to add or discuss. Um, it's okay with me if you want to take over the mic and voice. I know sometimes the text can be limiting, but I am going. I am planning on on following the local chat. Um, so if you want to just do the way we normally do with uh, putting comments and questions into text chat. I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. In fact, this is not a long presentation. Um, in fact, I was mentioning to Chantel, one of the things I found very interesting the, over the last month is we've had some that have gone 90 minutes and people aren't logging in, <laughs> which is really good, all right, that um, we've got topics that are capturing the interests of the participants that are here. Um, the other comment that I want to make is I want to talk a little bit about the history of the museum before we actually go in and um, look around. And uh, some of this was already in the write-up that uh, Chantel put on the website. But um, a number of years ago, James Madison University asked, contacted me and said that they were putting up a sim in Second Life. Actually, it's the second time they had tried it. 
and they wanted to play around with some different ideas. They wanted to um, have a geology museum on the on the campus of JMU, and I said, "Oh, absolutely, that'd be a lot of fun." So I designed it, and it existed for a while, and then the funding, I guess, got dropped from it, and they had to pull the sim. And uh, to be quite honest, um, I was sad when that decision was made. And then I talked with uh, Chantel and Jess, and they stepped up to the plate and said, well, if you want to rebuild some of those exhibits on the Second Life Sim, feel free to do so. And they gave me this parcel. So I am very grateful to uh, Jess and Chantel and Science Circle for giving me the opportunity uh, to recreate um, at least one of the exhibits. There actually was three in the original museum. One was on paleogeography, one was on fossils, one was on minerals. And I recreated the paleogeography one exactly as it existed on the JMU sim. Um, the minerals and the fossils one were more difficult to recreate. And I thought that I would go on a different theme for uh, this new version that we'll get into. So without further ado, let me uh, start on the outside of the museum. And here we go. And um, originally when I put this together, it was going to be a very simple uh, build. And it was just a gray structure. And then Chantel said she wanted a few more pictures for the outside. And I said, oh, sure, no problem. So the first one that you see here, of course, I think everybody recognizes as the Grand Canyon. And I'm going to be doing more with this. Uh, talk to Chantel and Jess this morning. Uh, at the end of this month, June 29th, there's going to be a virtual science fair. And I hope to get together with Greg. And Greg, I do not see on um, to talk about various sims on the Grand Canyon that I've done. He's done. Uh, I've done one on Second Life, but that'll be coming up June 29th. All right. Then over here, you see a globe. Uh, it's actually a um, reconstruction of Pangaea uh, as existed about 230 million years ago with Tethys. And if you come behind here, and I don't know if we're all going to fit, um, I threw up a couple of pictures uh, last summer. Last summer, I was able to, I wonder if I could move this over or disable it for everybody can see. Yeah, that, that would be really good. Can we get a copy of the globes? Um, good question, Baragon. I'm not sure who created them. It, oh, I created them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess I could. I don't know who created the textures. That's my only concern. Let's talk about that later. But uh, I guess I just dropped it on a sphere. My concern would be the scripts that rotated and the um, and the textures where they're copyrighted. Um, anyway, if you can cam behind the globe, it shows a picture that I took last summer. Um, I was on vacation up in New York, and these are some rocks that I took a picture of that are very famous. It's the uh, unconformity between the Ordovician rocks that are on the right hand side and Silurian rocks that are on the left. It was a major mountain building event that occurred about 500 million years ago in New York. And what happened was a volcanic island arc slammed into the North American continent, created a mountain range to the north and west of New York, and at the same time uh, tilted the black shale layers that are on the, um, the right-hand side and converted some of them into slates. And then uh, the sea came back in, formed the limestone and sandstones that are on top of the shales. And then they got rotated a second time, at least a, one, or, one more time, uh, when Pangea formed. So I felt it was appropriate to uh, put uh, this picture was near the globe, although the globe is starting to hide it. Then over here. Hello? Did we lose voice? 
I've still got the red dot back. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, Vivox has been coming on and off. Then the picture right in front of me here shows a trilobite, these things that are related to uh, modern day horseshoe crabs and lobsters. I was doing a field trip a couple of years ago in West Virginia and came across this fossil. Um, and there was a lot of excitement. This is one of the best fossils that I've found over the last couple of years. He's about 350 million years ago. Uh, ended up donating him, and there were about 11 other fossils that I found at this spot, all which got donated to the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Yeah, in some spots, um, thylobites are very common. In other areas, they're very rare. There are some spots, like I've, there's one I've gone to, Catawba Mountain, that I'll be discussing. Going there 30 years, have yet to find a trilobite. Uh, what kind did you find? Um, Nature, if I'm selling it, saying it right. You know which kind it is or how old it is? Nat? Yeah, if you could send me a picture of it, uh, if you're not sure what it is, maybe I can help you identify it. All right, everybody should be able to get into the museum. I know when the, we first got this building, it was set only to owner. That's good. Everybody's spread out here a little bit. I'm going to actually start over on this side of the, the room. The <laughs> Black Friday sale. Yeah, we'll lock the door. I can lock the door until a certain time, and then we'll open it up and let everybody stampede in. But this is good. This is a good number of people. So I was afraid that we'd have just, we'd have too many. So anyway, the, the first floor of the museum is dedicated to what I call paleogeography. Um, we're locked in. No, we're not locked in. Um, you can always TP out, say this is G. So um, I went to uh, college for geology back in the 1970s, early 80s, and it was a great time to be at the colleges and universities because plate tectonics, Uh, is any better? Okay, we back. <laughs> okay, you let me know if it's a problem. I can start typing. It's just going to take us a lot longer to go through the museum if I do everything in text. All right, so what I was saying was that in the in the 1970s and 80s, we understood the basics of continental drift, or I should say plate tectonics. And uh, then the question became, uh, where were the continents in the past? You know, we understood, I would say in the 1970s, that there was a supercontinent. We could reconstruct, um, you know, where the continents were up to, say, the last 200 million years. Um, but the big question was, what was the Earth like prior to uh, Pangaea? Was there always a supercontinent prior to that, were some of the questions that people were asking in the 70s and 80s. And when I finished my uh, undergraduate work at Cornell and got my bachelor's, I decided to go to the University of Chicago. And um, there was a team So maybe 
I need to start typing this. Voice back. All right, I guess I'll repeat it. So there was a team that was was working on uh, getting the, uh, or trying to figure out where the continents were. So they collected as much fossil and rock evidence they could. And um, the leader was Dr. Fred Ziegler. He was also my evaluator for my graduate work. But um, over here, I put a picture of Chris Cotiz, who was, and still is, a good friend that I met at the University of Chicago. Uh, Chris was interested in helping Fred come up with the computer graphics, which Fred knew nothing about. Back in those days, we mostly had um, mainframe computers. Um, the microcomputers weren't coming out yet until the late latter part of the 1980s. A lot was still done on mainframe computers and Calcom plotters, that sort of thing. But uh, the work of Chris Cotiz is shown around the room. And um, they're basically arranged, they should be arranged roughly in chronological order here, as I recall. I've tried to arrange them that way. Oops. I may have messed them up a little bit when I was doing it. But if you look in the if you look in the uh, upper left hand corner, it gives the geologic time period and also the age and millions of years. So some of the earliest ones, and we've got pretty good data going back to about 600 uh, million years ago, showing the supercontinent of Rodinia over here for the late Proterozoic. Also shows the uh, glacial ice at the South Pole that's here. And then we go through time, and, uh, and Chris did 20 million year slices for the Paleozoic. Um, and then as he got closer to modern day, he went in 10 million year slices. So here's the late Cambrian over here. What you're seeing is that the, um, um, that the, con that the supercontinent of Rodinia started to split apart. And some of the main cratons, some of the main plates or continents are starting to be established. You can see the North American, also known as Laurentian plate there. Uh, they've also got Baltica. Um, there was a large supercontinent, or I should say a group of continents, uh, for South America, Africa, North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia, that was, still, that was still together and located at the South Pole. And I apologize for bumping anyone as we go along here. And then as you go along this wall here, you go progressively through time. And again, feel free to cam in these individual pictures. Uh, by the way, Chris was, was very nice to give me permission to, uh, to use his work here um, uh, in Second Life. In fact, he said he always dreamed of having a museum to display his work. So I said, well, I'll be happy to take care of that. So then we get to the middle Ordovician, which is about 458 million years ago, um, and then it jumps to the Silurian. Um, these, by the way, these maps have been used extensively by other geologists of the U.S. Geological Survey. If you want to try and address sort of any problem in geology, it really helps it put it into a plate tectonic sort of context. Um, I know I do a lot with evolution. We're going to be talking more about that on the second floor. Um, and some of the extinction events that have occurred. Um, for example, the one at the end of the Permian when I was in college was typically tied into plate tectonics. In a minute. All right, so then we go along further here through geologic time. This next one is early Devonian about 390 million years ago. Then we go to the early Carboniferous. And as we go through time, you should notice that the continents are starting to come together again uh, to form the supercontinent known as Pangaea. And by the late Carboniferous, early Permian, um, you essentially have this supercontinent extending all the way from the, the North Pole to the South, um, very similar to uh, Rodinia that we saw at the beginning of these series of slides. And uh, when I was going through college, I was taught there was this major extinction at the end of the uh, Carboniferous, where most Paleozoic organisms, things like trilobites and eurypterids and graptolites, 
they die, okay, as the, or go extinct as the continents are slammed together. So it's, these maps are, have, are very useful, okay, for talking about different theories like that. And then over here, um, I show uh, the modern current plates of the world that are used, that were used by the paleogeographic research team. And Sister G is asking, there was a great permanent extinction too, right? Yeah, that's what I just mentioned. In fact, I was talking with Chantel before. There were actually five main extinctions that occurred throughout, uh, from about uh, 600 million years ago to the, the present. There was one at the end of the Ordovician about 500 million years ago. There was one um, at the end of the Permian, of course. We're all familiar with the one at the end of the Cretaceous that wiped out the dinosaurs. There was one in the Triassic, and I'm missing one. I forget which one that is. Um, and that's a good question, Tagline. There's a book that my son got me for, I think it was my birthday, called The Sixth Extinction. And if that's a topic that you're interested in, I highly recommend that book, um, because the author goes through the evidence uh, and her concern that we are headed for a sixth extinction. Um, all right, and then what I've done is I put a couple of other maps uh, around this room as well. So here's another one that, um, a paleogeographic map, I believe this is for the late Ordovician. Um, yeah, the sixth extinction. Can somebody Google it for me? Um, and put maybe the Amazon link um, into local. Yeah, that's, that's the argument that's been made. And of course, uh, ma major mass extinction events um, have multiple causes behind it. And um, it, you know, some of it could be extinctions, thank you, um, or um, it could be a result of an extraterrestrial impact. Of course, that's what um, everyone is uh, promoting for the, the, the dinosaur extinction. Um, it could be a result of, of other factors as well that I want to get into later. All right, Ori's already read it. Terrific. Ori, did you like the book? Yeah, I mean, it's what I like is it gives a good historical content. My main concern with the sixth extinction is that a lot of it deals with anecdotal evidence. Um, but it, there are some really good uh, stories about it. The main question is, how does it end? Well, I don't want to tell you that because then you won't read the book. We'll have to wait around and see. All right, and, um, oh, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting off key here. All right, um, I was going to say more about, uh, off track, I was going to say more about this map here. One of the things that Chris has been working on is trying to refine his paleogeographic maps, put more detail uh, behind them. Uh, the colors represent elevation, so the dark brown represent mountains, uh, the green areas represent lowlands, the light blue represents shallow seas, and the dark blue represents uh, deep ocean basins. So, um, in addition to being more colorful, it's, it's giving us more information about what the land masses were like. Here's one for the late Cretaceous that Chris did. And on here, if you look closely, he's also put the location of the, um, uh, put the location of the crater, okay, that uh, was produced when the, when the meteor or whatever it was struck the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. All right, so um, also on here, you see my contact information. Feel free to email me. I've listed that up there. Or contact me in Second Life. Um, the research that I've been working on has mainly dealt with um, uh, paleogeography and uh, paleo longitudes. One of the things that I was interested in as a graduate student is trying to make these maps more quantitative. And if you look at just about every map that I've shown you, there are no latitude and longitude uh, grids that are on here. Latitude we can get at with uh, Paleo um, magnetic data, but the paleo longitudes are more difficult. Uh, Tagline's asking, how likely is it that there have been 
land masses above sea level that are not include these maps? Um, that's a good question tagline, and I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Um, trying to come up with um, elevations is a tricky business. I know that there's been some research on this at the University of New Hampshire. There were geologists that tried to measure the elevation of, for example, the Rockies by measuring um, the, the vesicles, the air pockets in basalts, and they got some rough information about it. Um, but a lot of this is very qualitative. And what I'm going to be discussing next is some quantitative means to try and uh, determine uh, the location of the continents in the past. So what I did was, for my uh, graduate school work, I tried to determine uh, what the latitudes were based on uh, basically measuring the differences or how similar faunas were between two areas. And the idea was that the uh, further apart they were, farther apart they would be, the um, um, the less the similarity between two faunas were in terms of the number of species that it contained. And when we go upstairs, I'll show you some more of that. All right, but as we go, how do you define latitude? You need a very good point, uh, Syzygy. Um, well, of course, today we use the prime meridian, which is located in Grand England, right? So what I did with my graduate school work was I said, we're going to use the Apollonian plate, which has most of England on it, as our zero point, And then we're going to measure everything relative to that. So um, I came up with relative paleolonitudes. And that's something that I wrestled with in my dissertation and also some science papers that I published, is that we don't know exactly where that is relative to modern day. So the zero point may have drifted around as Avalonian moved. <laughs> but at least that's better than saying, well, we think that uh, North America was somewhere to the west of, of England, or that Sweden was somewhere to the east of England. This, get the point that I'm making, we're trying to refine these estimates. All right, the maps that you see on this wall here um, show uh, more recent time periods. So now we see Pangaea, and as we go through the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, um, we notice that Pangaea starts drifting apart and the continents start splitting apart until we finally get to more modern day representation of the continents. And that's shown over here. I believe we have a modern map. Yes, on this one, the third one from the end. Right, Syzygy. Yeah, or that's a separate issue that you bring up. Um, if you want to get latitude, you can use paleomagnetic information. You can collect iron particles that are in the rock, and you can measure their orientation, and you can get the latitude of a plate in the past and also how much it's rotated. Uh, Geophysicists pretty much argue that, yeah, there are magnetic shifts uh, around the rotational point of the Earth, but if you average it out, certainly over a million or two million years, that the um, magnetic pole of the Earth averages out to the rotational uh, axis of the Earth. So that is not a major concern among geophysicists. Nowhere near as much as what I wrestled with, with trying to define a zero point for longitude. All right, and then um, over here, these last two maps, I'll edit them so I can point to them. Um, you know, it's sort of fun. Meteorologists try and predict what the weather is a week in advance, and we can easily find out if they're right or wrong. Geologists and plate tectonic geophysicists predict 250 million, 500 million years in the future. So we never have to worry about being proved wrong because no one's going to be around, um, or certainly none of us, to, to say yes or no. Uh, but this is based on the on, on current uh, plate movements. Uh, the second from the right one, uh, we assume that uh, Africa is going to continue to move to the north and slam into uh, Europe and eventually um, wipe out the Mediterranean Sea. 
And this last one over here assumes that there's a 500 million year, there we go, 500 million year cycle to the formation of supercontinents. Uh, and then eventually, uh, maybe in 250 million years or so, uh, all the continents will come back together. All right, Radrun asks, uh, how can the, all the continents be balanced on one side of the Earth? Should not the ocean distribute uniformly around the globe? Um, well, that's based on, um, you know, where the continents are located is, is controlled by the forces that move them. And geophysicists are still arguing over that. Um, we originally thought that was convective cells that were driving the continents. But I talked to a volcanologist about a month ago, and he said, no, it's subduction. That it's the weight of the seafloor that's attached to the continents that pulls it back into the Earth. So even an understanding of what drives the plates is being uh, debated now. Um, and where they're going to end up is just, uh, you know, where those forces, uh, you know, eventually lead them to. Weren't the pillars of Hercules closed in the past and they'll close again? Um, and uh, Scissor G, you're going to have to tell me where, were the, where are the pillars of Hercules? Scissor G. They're at the entrance of the Mediterranean. Yeah, eventually what's going to happen is Africa is moving to the north and Europe is moving to the south. So they're going to slam together and eventually what's going to happen is the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, the Mediterranean Sea, are going to close and turn into the Mediterranean mountain range. Um, just like Tethys Sea did. Uh, when India slammed into Asia and now formed the Himalayan mountains. Um, and we have a question up here about uh, can land masses be subducted out of sight? And the answer to that is no. Uh, the density of granite, which makes up most of the land masses, is only 2.67. It's too light. You can't ram them into um, the you can't ram them into the subduction zones. It just doesn't work. The only thing you can subduct is heavier seafloor uh, material that has a density of around 2.83, somewhere in there. It is the mid, let's see, we got some other great questions coming here. Um, is the mid Atlantic rift the main engine of drift? And I used to think it was, but there are other geologists that are saying that there are other ways of doing it. So, when I was in college, I was taught that at the mid-ocean <coughs> ridge, seafloor material separates and pushes the continents apart. All right, and I'm trying to show that with my hands, and I realize that you don't see anything when I'm doing it with my hands. Um, another way of driving the plates is that as seafloor material is being created, it cools, it becomes denser, and it's pulled back down into the trenches. And some geologists are now saying that the all of those plates as they become denser uh, is what uh, is the main driving mechanism for, uh, for the uh, continents and the plates. Will plates fuse or split apart? They can do both. All right. Um, good example of, plate, of a plate splitting apart is in Ethiopia today. You can look at a modern day <coughs> Diron Bay map. You can see where the northeast part of Africa is actually splitting apart. It's like a big zipper. Uh, plates can fuse together. Well, I already mentioned India is slammed into Asia, producing the Himalayan mountains. So that's already happened, and there are suspects that it, suspicions that it could happen in other places. <coughs> All right, um, I put this panel up here. Um, it shows a lot of the geologic evidence for um, our understanding of plate tectonics. This is the sort of uh, evidence that uh, uh, Fred Ziegler used to, and, and Chris Cotige used to, to put these together. And what I use routinely in my class, for example, uh, you notice in northern England, and they've got metamorphic rocks for the Devonian. So what does that tell you? Well, metamorphic rocks formed by very high pressures and temperatures. So it suggests that northern England slammed into something and that's something was most likely the North American continent. Um, and so I'm saying that it's sort of like a big detective story. 
And it's really through working together. This is what I love about the science circle is the way that we share data on a global basis. There are just some problems that have to be solved globally. <coughs> and or yes, yeah, so is the tectonics driven by an external body gravity or ocean water weight. Um, it's the weight of the plates. Okay, we we now know that the surface of the earth is made up of crust and the upper part of the mantle. And that's created in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, like the mid-ocean uh, ridge. And then it's destroyed in, in the deep trenches area. I don't believe the ocean water really adds that much to this process. Uh, ocean water is important <coughs> in the fact that it takes, it's subducted, it goes down with the plate. And when water gets inside the earth, it's, it's very interesting. It lowers the melting point of rocks which helps uh, melt the rocks at the base of the, the continents, and that's what creates the volcanoes. So, or to answer your question, I think water and ocean water is important for sort of creating magma, but I don't think it uh, is involved in actually driving the plates. You guys are asking some really great questions. Keep them up, and I'd be happy to stop. So how would that work for a place like a Jovian moon, like such as Europa? Good question. Um, we are only starting to learn <coughs> about plate tectonics on other planets. For example, uh, Mars is the one. Mars is the one that's been studied the most. Um, and what we found is that Mars is about half the size of the Earth, so it cooled off and probably does not have any plate tectonic cycle to it. Um, there, the rocks are water ice too. Yeah, so obviously there's water on uh, Europa. I found there's water on Ganymede. Um, one of the things we'd like to know, it, just basics, you know, are there quakes on other planets? And, and some of you may know we just landed a, a, a rover on um, Mars and sunk a seismograph into the Mars to find out if there's quakes there. Uh, we have put seismographs on the moon. Interestingly enough, there are moon quakes, and some of them get really uh, powerful, up to mag sixes. Uh, I know one astronomer that told me if astronauts had been on the moon when a mag six went off with the low gravity, they would have achieved escape velocity, and the quake would have been able to shoot that astronaut off into outer space. Uh, is tectonic movement dependent on a molten core? Uh, Bergen, I think it is, again, but I'm following sort of traditional models of, uh, you know, of geophysics. Like I said, there's some debate among other geologists that I've talked to. All right, uh, so over on this board, it shows um, some of the contributors to the Paleo <coughs> Geographic Map Project. And one other thing that we're doing is, yeah, the internal heat of the Earth may be irrelevant. I, I think that's unlikely, but like I said, it's still being discussed among geophysicists. Mike's asking, an ice moon would have a global ocean under the ice. Uh, what the rock is doing, it would be hard to say. There may even be a second layer, a different form of ice. All right. Um, <coughs> Any other questions before we go to the second floor? Because this is about where I thought we'd be. Take about a half an hour down here and then another half hour going upstairs. Look at this map of ocean currents. Is there no curl of oceans current in the... All right, let's talk about the... Let me zoom in on the modern day map. Those circles are called gyres, and I've labeled there's three of them in the northern uh, uh, northern Atlantic, and there's just one in the Antarctic. And no, there are other gyres, I just haven't put them on here on the map. And notice that the reason why there are fewer gyres that are present in the southern hemisphere is because there's an opening between the land mass between the southern tip of South America and Antarctica other words to flow through it. So one of the activities I like giving to my students is, here's a map of the world. What would the uh, gyres and oceanic circulation look at, look like? 
interests discover a plan without a molten core with play movement. Yeah, I agree. There's there's a lot more interesting research to be done, I think, with plate tectonics and other continents. And there's a professor at Virginia Tech that uh, is asking those sort of questions. Okay, would everybody um, head upstairs on the steps? We can talk a little bit more about plate tectonics and some of the research that I've been doing. But again, uh, continue to sort of feed in your questions. All right, so one of the things that I was talking with Chantel about this morning and Jess is um, the idea of ideographic versus nomothetic paleontology. And originally I was going to, um, I was going to devote this to um, minerals and, and fossils up here, but we had that excellent uh, panel discussion a couple of weeks ago where we talked about um, current problems that are being faced in our disciplines. So I decided to dedicate the second floor of this uh, museum to where uh, what I think are the, the cutting research topics that are going on. And I, I figured I'd start off by talking about ideographic versus nomothetic. <clears throat> ideographic means that you go out and you basically just do some field trips and you describe maybe the rocks you find or the fossils you find or plants or whatever. And, um, you know, you publish those, maybe you come up with a new species of fossils. And for a while, for many years, okay, this is the way that geology and paleontology was done. And then it gets really boring. You know, you go to these talks and, okay, it's another new species of brachiopod that really we really need to cloud our brains with anymore. But um, in the 1980s, uh, there were a number of paleontologists, particularly Steve Gould at Harvard, uh, Tom Schaff at Chicago, Jack Sapkowski at Chicago, and Dave Rao. And they started to come up with another concept called nomothetic paleontology. And I think this approach is very appropriate to what we're trying to do here at Science Circle, where you go out, you collect information, but then you try and tie it into a more broader context or more broader problems. And... Uh, and Gould in 1980, and uh, then requoted for Thera in 2012, says, uh, geology and paleontology tries to extract almost law-like characteristics. Um, and I, I may, some of you may have heard me tell the story, and where's Mike Shaw? Uh, when I was in graduate school, I remember uh, Tom Schaff came into the lunchroom. There we go, Mike. Came into the lunchroom, and he started yelling at graduate students, and he said, I want to know something. He goes, I want to know why there are no gas laws in geology and paleontology. The chemists have them, and I want one of you guys to put together some gas laws for me. And his comments those days really struck with me, um, because it's true. I mean, basically, whether you're talking about chemistry, where you're dealing with the random movement of gases, or whether you're talking about fossil organisms with larvae in an ocean that are randomly distributed about, there should be more overarching arching uh, laws, okay, that describe, okay, the movement of whether it's gas particles or larvae um, that eventually controls fossils. And um, that's something that uh, has really been driven, driving me and, um, you know, in some of the research that I've done. And Syzygy says that looks like a phenomenological law or does it originate from some more general theory or can it lead to such a thing? Well, that's something that I've been, been looking into. Uh, the clam law, right? Okay, if you look at some of the other um, other slides that I have here, uh, one of the things that I started doing uh, and collecting in my, well, in my graduate school work, I just started collecting data on fossil clams from um, the western interior, from Wyoming and Colorado and so on. And, and I wanted to come up with these laws, but we didn't have the technology, we didn't have the internet, um, we didn't have the databases that we have now. 
Uh, I remember getting together at a conference with uh, Dick Bombach at Chicago, and I said to him, Dick, you were, you were one of my evaluators. I just didn't have the technology to do what I wanted in the 80s, but I certainly could do it today. This was like 2005. So he said, sure, go ahead and do it. So I ended up uh, putting together large amounts of data on modern CLAM, and based on modern CLAM distributions, I started to look at, the, at how similarities in faunas between two areas is controlled by the distance. And I came up with using the way that physics guys work. I plotted up these graphs and came up with some simple formulas, and some of them I've shown here, um, showing the relationship between similarity and distance. And then I inverted it. I said, I'm going to measure how similar fossils are in the past and use them to get distance. And I was able to come up in 2011 with this paleogeographic map that was published. Good question. Can you generalize that the other species? That's something I haven't looked at yet, but I was interested in. Um, and it really has to do with a couple of things. You know, what is this law based on? Well, part of it is controlled by how long larvae stay in the water column. That's controlled by the biology, right? So if larvae are what are called less trophic, that is, they have an egg sac, that's going to limit them. The, you know, the critters, they eat with the egg sac, and then they have no choice. They either die or they sell out, they become adults. Some plankton, though, can feed on other plankton, which means they can stay in the water column for a longer period of time. And then the other thing is not so matter the type of species, but the speed of the currents, right? So the faster the currents are moving, um, that's going to control how far they can distribute. So um, this law is really defined by the behavior of the plankton and also current systems. And it seems like the current systems are a constant, and the larvae may be as well. Um, so it's something that I would want to look into in more detail. But yeah, that would be an interesting thing to look at, is whether other organisms follow this law or not. An overarching quality theory for evolutionary biology. I'm not so much looking for evolution. This is more for spatial relationships rather than temporal or evolutionary ones. So I'm looking at, um, in terms of distance, how that controls how similar the fossils are. And if the plates, you see, there's a reason for why I picked the, the Ordovician. All the continents are along the equator, which means that if I know distance, then I can convert that into latitudes, right? If the plates were at different latitudes, then I've got a problem, right? Because now I've got to worry about the spacing in terms of both latitudes and longitudes. So it would have made the problem a lot more, would have been much more difficult. Any other questions? All right, on this panel, what I did was I listed um, some of the people that I think, some of these names you're going to recognize, uh, people that are doing some amazing work in paleontology. We were fortunate a couple of weeks ago to get Shu Hai Zhao on Second Life Science Circle. He's just doing amazing work here on the evolution of organisms in the late Precambrian. And he did a fantastic job summarizing uh, his work that was there. Somebody I'd like to get is Sterling Nesbitt. I don't know how he feels about Second Life. But he um, and Michelle are doing some terrific work on the evolution of early dinosaurs. Maybe we could get Shuai to talk Sterling in and come on for a lecture because that would be really cool. To hear. I've heard him speak in real life, and he has some, great, has some great presentations. And then, of course, we all recognize Dr. Alex Hastings for his work on Titanoboa and his implications for global climate change. In fact, that's something I've give, been giving a lot more thought to, is um, can paleontologists be environmental scientists? Alex would absolutely say yes. And I'm starting to notice other paleontologists like um, Alicia Steigel at Ohio State University um, and Rowan Lockwood at um, William & Mary, okay, that are starting to look at, can we look at environmental issues both in deep time? Uh, Alicia Steigel is looking at the whole issue of invasive species and 
you've probably heard this story in modern day where there, there are certain species that attach themselves to ships and get put into different ecosystems and end up almost wiping them out because they're such nasty predators. Um, Alicia is saying the same thing happened in the geologic past where invasive species, not due to ships or anything, but just due to uh, ancient dispersal, okay, um, can have a drastic effect on ecosystems. Yes, we did have a presentation on Titanoboa, uh, Aaron. Yeah, and it's also cool to look, see the links between paleontology, biology, geology, and geophysics. In fact, that's one of the things I like about Science Circle is that we can come together and uh, have sort of this interdisciplinary discussion. All right. Um, some of you may know that I'm working on a uh, a, a uh, app to identify fossils and then use that for evolutionary studies or or further geological studies. But basically, as we all know, um, it all starts with careful field work. Here's a nice picture that I took of. I believe this is the Ordovician rocks that are in Virginia. And um, these panels start to summarize some of the work that I've done um, with refining the, the biostratigraphy the, for the uh, extinction at the end of the late Ordovician. Excuse me, my voice is getting dry. Yeah, we're almost done here. Uh, so um, I went through uh, this book. I didn't drink the seawater now. Um, when I was, last time I was at the Smithsonian Institution, I, um, I was given this book on teaching paleontology in the 21st century. And I went through it and for this exhibit and listed some of the topics that geologists and paleontologists and biologists are looking at these days. Taphonomy is the study of how organisms decompose, how they get preserved or how they don't. Ontogeny is how organisms go through different life stages. Um, population variation is the typical uh, work that's done prior to doing uh, evolutionary studies to see how populations can change and develop new species. Uh, Paleoecology is the relationship to organisms to their ancient environments. And functional morphology is how organisms um, can adapt or not adapt to their environment. Right, there was a famous book that Gould published on Tygeny and phylogeny um, in there. He reviews a lot of the older theories that, um, that biologists were looking at and basically argues that the way that evolution occurs is through neoteny, that the juveniles tend to compete with adults and win out. And those are the ones uh, that eventually go on to create new species. So here's a little teaser. Um, yesterday I was out in the mountains of Virginia and I was telling Chantel about this. So I've been collecting data um, on the uh, Ordovician. And one of the things that uh, I've been talking to Jess about is coming back in the fall and doing a presentation on uh, just that topic. And Aaron asked, do you think maybe life will find a way and dinosaurs will walk the earth again? Uh, through this question of John Hammond. Um, well, the, one of the principles of evolution is that when organisms go extinct, um, they tend uh, not to evolve again. And as much as we, some of us would like to see dinosaurs coming back, um, in terms of it happening naturally, that's highly unlikely. There are a number of people who are working on uh, reverse engineering birds and trying to bring them back that way. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I always thought was possible is there's a lot of a genetic information in our genes. And not all of it is expressed for modern day purposes. Um, that birds 
they indeed have all the dinosaur information it needs, just uh, the proteins just don't turn them on. Um, so, for example, if you put the right uh, protein when, say, the tail is developing, the right hormone, you could get a bird with a longer tail. Or you could have uh, a trait expressed like teeth in birds instead of a beak. Or you could convert the feathers in a bird to scale, or just leave the feathers there. We know some dinosaurs had feathers as well as scales. Um, so there are some people that are saying, if you want to bring dinosaurs back, that would be the way to do it. it yeah, the Jurassic Park model is not going to work. Most scientists agree with that now. Um, you know, they're saying you'd have to do it a different way. Yeah, it was a, Jurassic Park is a totally different model, okay? In Jurassic Park, the idea was that a mosquito, okay, would bite a, um, a dinosaur, extract some of the blood. You get the DNA from that and then put that in, say, a modern animal and somehow recreate a dinosaur. And when paleontologists looked at that, they said, ah, it's just not going to work. I mean, they tried over and over again. No. Synergy is asking, you don't need to extract the whole DNA strand. You need, well, not all DNA contains the information you need for different characteristics, right? All right. And I forget what it is in humans. I mean, and even some of the DNA creates characteristics like for an appendix. What? You know, there's obviously a gene that creates an appendix in every one of us. And why? I mean, the appendix is not used for anything today. It was probably used for something in the past. So I agree. But the question is, you need certain key DNA strands. And that's always been the concern, is getting the right amount of DNA, okay, to produce the characteristics that you want. Even in looking at modern organisms, they tried mammoths that are frozen in Siberia. And even then, okay... Um, that, um, you know, the, the DNA, I believe, was only 3% uh, complete. Okay, thanks, Scissor G says it repopulates our gut microbes when our immune systems attack. I knew there would be somebody here that knew more about anatomy than I did. All right, we're about an hour. I'm glad we, I like to keep it to an hour because I know we've got other things to do in real life. Oh, the second globe outside, Mike, is just um, uh, a globe of the uh, modern day Earth. Thanks, tagline. All right, Chantel, do you want to talk about what's coming up? Because I know you've been sending out notices. I know June 29th is the uh, Second Life Science Fair uh, with the presentations.
Thanks, Mike. Appreciate all of you guys coming. No, I mean, not all life is going to be killed out by mass extinction events. Uh, but there are some times that it came close. You look at the terminal Permian one, or the terminal Cretaceous, the Carboniferous, uh, there are estimates 75 to 99 percent of all species were wiped out. All right, so I think we'll wrap it up at this point and uh, look forward to seeing you for the, for the science fair and other future science circle presentations. Yeah, certainly cockroaches. Uh, Ori, it's June 29th. 